Somewhere in the Pacific, a red warning flashes across a dozen screens. A hypersonic anti-ship cruise missile has been detected. It is traveling at Mach 3. That is 2,300 miles per hour. It is coming straight for the USS Gerald R. Ford, and it is 60 seconds away. On board are 5,000 sailors. Below deck sits $13 billion worth of sovereign American territory. If this missile connects, it will not just sink a ship. It will rewrite the balance of power in the Pacific. But the carrier is not alone. It sits at the center of a strike group. Six destroyers, two submarines, a guided missile cruiser. Every single one of them was built for this exact moment. Deep inside the ship, in a room called the Combat Direction Center, there is no screaming, no panic, just the hum of electronics and the glow of blue screens. Fifty technicians sit at consoles, their faces lit by radar sweeps. They are watching a dot move across a map. It is closing fast. The clock starts now. T minus 60 seconds. The bodyguards. The first weapon fired is not a missile. It is not a bullet. It is a radio wave. Before anyone pulls a trigger, the ship fights back with electrons. This is electronic warfare, and it happens at the speed of light. Mounted on the superstructure of the carrier is a boxy gray system called SLQ-32, nicknamed Slick-32. It looks like an oversized air conditioner. Inside, it is scanning the electromagnetic spectrum, listening for the radar frequencies that guide the incoming missile. The moment it identifies the threat, it fires back. Not with explosives, with noise. Pure, overwhelming radio noise blasted directly on the same frequency the missile uses to see. Imagine you are driving at night and someone shines a bright light directly into your eyes. You cannot see the road. You cannot see the signs. You swerve. That is jamming. The missile's radar is blinded. Its computer does not know where the carrier is anymore. It starts to drift off course. But jamming alone is not enough. As the SLQ-32 screams electronic static into the sky, launchers on the deck fire small canisters into the air. They burst open and release clouds of thin metal foil strips. This is chaff. Each strip is cut to exactly the right length to reflect the missile's radar frequency. On the missile's screen, the chaff looks like a ship, a bright, glowing false target. The missile's computer has to choose, the real carrier or the ghost. If it chooses wrong, it veers away and splashes harmlessly into the ocean. But if the missile's seeker is advanced enough, if it can filter out the noise and burn through the jamming, it keeps coming. And now, the crew has only one option left. 45 seconds. The aircraft carrier does not defend itself first. That is not how the strike group works. 20 miles away, an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer cuts through the water. It is smaller than the carrier, faster, and it is armed to the teeth. The destroyer's mission is simple, to die for the carrier if it has to. Every sensor on that ship is linked to a system called Aegis. It is short for Advanced Electronic Guidance and Instrumentation System, but nobody uses the full name. Think of Aegis as the brain that connects every ship in the group. It sees everything. It tracks everything. And it decides who shoots. The moment the missile was detected, Aegis calculated its trajectory. It assigned the nearest destroyer to intercept. No human made that choice. The computer did. Now, deep in the destroyer's vertical launch system, a missile ignites. This is the SM-6, the standard missile. It is the long arm of the strike group. Its job is to kill threats 
before they get close. The SM-6 roars out of its cell and arcs into the sky. It accelerates to Mach 3.5, faster than the incoming missile. It climbs to 65,000 feet. From up there, it can see for 100 miles. T minus 30 seconds. The jamming did not work. The SM-6 missed. The missile is still inbound. It is crossing the inner defense ring now. There is no time to reload. The carrier has to defend itself. Launchers on the deck rotate skyward. The weapon is the evolved Sea Sparrow missile, ESSM. It is smaller than the SM-6, faster, more agile. The evolved Sea Sparrow missile does not intercept from miles away. It waits until the target is close. Then, it moves. These missiles pull turns that would kill a human pilot. 15 Gs, 20 Gs. The control surfaces flick so fast they blur. The missile is built for one purpose, a skin-to-skin -skin impact. It does not carry a warhead that explodes near the target. It strikes the target directly, metal on metal. Kinetic energy alone is enough to shred the incoming threat into pieces. Four evolved Sea Sparrow missiles launch in two seconds. They streak upward, leaving white trails. The incoming missile tries to evade. It twists. It dives. But physics wins. One of the evolved Sea Sparrow missiles connects. There is a flash on the horizon. Debris tumbles toward the water. But one piece does not tumble. One piece keeps flying. T minus 10 seconds. It is called a leaker. A piece of the missile that survived. Or maybe the warhead separated on purpose. Either way, it is still coming. The crew can see it now. A black dot against the gray sky, growing larger every second. The final weapon is already tracking it. Mounted on the starboard side is the Phalanx Close-In Weapon System. Sailors call it R2-D2 because it looks like the droid. But there is nothing cute about what it does. The Phalanx is fully autonomous. No human pulls the trigger. A radar locks onto the target. A computer calculates the intercept. And then it fires. The barrels spin up. The sound is a roar, a mechanical scream. The gun fires 20 millimeter tungsten rounds at 4,500 rounds per minute. That is 75 rounds every single second. The phalanx does not aim at the missile. It can it. The missile is moving too fast. Instead, it aims at where the missile is going to be. It creates a cloud, a wall of metal hanging in the air. The missile flies into that wall at Mach 3. The tungsten rounds are so dense they cut through the missile like a blade through paper. The warhead detonates early. The explosion is 500 yards from the ship. Debris splashes into the ocean. T minus zero seconds. Impact. The threat is neutralized 500 yards from the ship. Smoke drifts across the deck. The phalanx dome stops rotating. The crew in the combat direction center exhales. No cheering, no celebration, just confirmation. The radar screen is clear. The air is clear. The carrier continues on its heading. 5,000 sailors are safe. The strike group is intact. The mission continues. This is the result of decades of engineering. Layers upon layers of defense. Electronic warfare in the invisible spectrum. Long-range missiles in the sky. Mid-range interceptors at the horizon. And a Gatling gun on the deck. Every system has a backup. Every backup has a backup. The ocean is 12,000 feet deep and filled with threats. Submarines, mines, torpedoes, and missiles traveling faster than sound.
But the most dangerous thing in the water is not the weapon. It is the response. In those 60 seconds, a $13 billion ship and 5,000 human lives depend on a network of sensors, computers, and weapons working in perfect synchronization. One missed calculation and the missile hits. One failed system and the defense collapses. Let me know what you think in the comments. Subscribe to Shipline for the best naval ships, boats, and ocean videos on the internet.